And I want to first start by just uh, sort of credentialing myself and qualifying. Who am I? Why would you spend a beautiful Saturday morning uh, hanging out with me talking about persuasion and democracy in America? Uh, so we're going to click through a bunch of different pictures and I'm going to tell a little bit of a quick story. Um, everyone thinks that organizing is some big fancy thing. I've worked for presidents and the Zuckerbergs and uh, change.org and all these other sort of fancy people. Um, organizing really looks like this. <laughs> organizing is 2% um, glamour and 98% falling asleep in front of your computer uh, late nights uh, in jeans that probably don't fit anymore because you've eaten too much junk food. <laughs> so keep clicking. Sometimes you get the really exciting, incredible, inspiring moments like this one where I was walking uh, uh, with President Obama and talking about um, community organizing behind the scenes of an event. Keep clicking. But a lot of the time uh, you're out there on the streets uh, these days with a mask, hopefully. Um, uh, really engaging with your community members, not engaging with the fancy principal and the, the person who sort of represents the ideals that you're fighting for. And that's what we're really hoping to prepare you to do today. So this is me um, during the healthcare fight. Uh, here's another a picture of uh, me fighting for healthcare reform, one of my proudest issue advocacy accomplishments. Um, I ran actually the state of Arizona. So I'm really honored and pleased that we're partnering in Orange County with Arizona uh, uh, an increasingly important state in this country as we look at the trend from um, from red to purple to blue, which you guys in Orange County exemplify more than most. Keep trucking. Next picture. Um, in 2011, as Lisa mentioned, I ran the training department for President Obama's reelection campaign. So we had a team all across the country that helped train organizers like yourselves, citizens like yourselves, to take action in their communities in the most impactful, meaningful, scalable ways. Keep trucking. Next slide. Uh, and that led to uh, spending a lot of time with lots of different people um, in uh, dining rooms and restaurants and uh, arenas all across the country. Uh, this is a picture of the summer organizer program, um, which I helped start for the president. And we use this program to train hundreds of thousands of organizers like Lisa, who started as a summer organizer across the country, uh, not just young people, young people, retirees, uh, young parents. You can see in this picture, there's a real diversity of folks um, sitting around this, um, this table in Washington, DC with President Obama talking about community organizing. Next picture. Uh, I ran Virginia, vote for Virginia um, twice for the president in his, uh, both of his first election and his re-election, which was really fun. And there's me at a get out the vote training next. Uh, I helped uh, build and run the largest ever uh, grassroots training at an American inauguration. Um, this is uh, the um, le legacy conference, the Obama legacy conference in 2009 when he was uh, actually, I guess this was 2013 when he was elected for the second time. Next slide. Uh, and then I was executive director for President Obama's nonprofit OFA during his second term in office, where we worked on immigration reform, gun violence prevention, implementing health care reform, marriage, uh, minimum wage, all types of different issues. So I've worked on issue advocacy and electoral advocacy. Um, I've been an executive. I've been a grassroots organizer. I've been a volunteer. Um, and I just love organizing with my heart and soul. I think it's the most incredible way to connect to your community, to really uh, give back, um, and to make a huge impact. Uh, it is absolutely astonishing what we can do when we work together. And all of you in Orange County are a real testament to that at the congressional level. Next picture. Uh, so throughout my time, um, I've gotten to really benefit from the mentorship of President Obama. I worked for him for nine years uh, and uh, I, I just have never met a more incredible organizer than, than President Obama. But uh, he's not in office anymore. Uh, and you guys all know that we, we cry about it, you know, at least once a week. Uh, it is up to us as everyday citizens to not just continue that legacy. He would be disappointed if we just continued sort of doing what he did. It's up to us to dream bigger dreams than he could even ever imagine, uh, than he even ever does imagine. We already have done that with the incredible um, action that people have taken uh, in the streets and um, in their city council meetings and in their homes uh, around racial justice over the past few weeks uh, after the murders of um, a few too many black Americans. So um, next picture. Um, I, uh, 
I've done lots of different things since the, my time in um, working with President Obama in office, uh, but all of the things that um, really touch me close to my heart are um, ones where we get to build community with people who are like us or not like us. Um, and uh, I'm really honored and excited to be all of, with all of you here in Orange County to continue that work uh, in your own communities, in Arizona and in the country at large. So let's dig in and let's like get to the meat of the, the training here. Next slide. So the goals for this session are that you leave mastering conceptual fluency around persuasion, which is one of the key things you need to understand how, when, why, and where to do uh, if you're going to really make a huge impact. Um, I can't see the slide anymore, so I think, there we go. Begin playing with, um, you wanna begin playing with real world applications, so we're gonna have some practice time where you get to practice sort of quietly uh, and, um, and, and start to metabolize the different lessons that we've learned. You're gonna develop a toolkit to practice once you've left this session, which is even more important. Um, the best types of learning are continuous. And then I want to make sure that you leave with the confidence to take action in your communities, whatever that looks like. So next slide. Uh, the agenda for today, I'm going to just spend a second talking about the big picture and how we win uh, sort of countrywide. Then we'll talk about how we win day to day. We'll do some practice. We'll make some commitments and we'll do a debrief and Q&A. All right, next slide. So let's get into the big picture contest. This is the sexy inside baseball, exciting strategic stuff that um, that you don't get on MSNBC, but you do get here um, in Orange County. So next slide. I want to just like take a step back and really uh, get in the numbers, which is one of my favorite places to spend time. So anyone know, and you can type in the chat box, how many electoral votes we need to win the White House? How many electoral votes do we need? And I'm just looking down at my phone here so I can see your chats. All right. Electoral vote wise, we need 207 electoral votes in order to win the White House. Um, and what that uh, what that would break down to, and if we didn't if we didn't have the electoral college, which is a whole different conversation, uh, is basically 50 percent plus one. You're trying to build a um, a simple majority, kind of proportioned in a really strange way because of the electoral college, so that we have more people in the key states that matter turning out to vote for our candidate than our opponents do. So if we could go back to the slide for a second, there's a little grid. You guys did an incredible job in Orange County of getting to 50% plus one, which was your version of 270 electoral votes uh, when you elected uh, Congressman Ruda and so many other incredible uh, folks when you flipped the county blue in 2018. Um, in 2020, not only do we have to sort of maintain that progress, um, we really need to uh, focus on the Electoral College and on um, on winning states that matter such that we get to 270 electoral votes. So you have to sort of be focused in two places at once. And we're going to have a second later on in the training where we really ask you to think about whether you want to spend your time and energy majority it, sort of an expert work in Arizona or you want to spend your time and energy um, in district really thinking down ballot. Or maybe you want to do a little bit of both, which is really what I'd recommend. I think, you know, keeping it dynamic is ideal. So as we think about how we win elections, one of the key things that um, that is a is a sort of mistaken understanding for everyone is we don't actually everybody. If we were to talk to everybody in an election, we would waste our time talking to folks who uh, aren't going to vote no matter what we do. They're just not going to turn out um, folks who are never going to support our candidate um, or folks who are actively organizing against us. And we'll talk about this in a second, but your most precious resource between now and November of this year, it's not money, it's not your health, even though you think it is, it's time. So your, the big goal of today's training is to get you to a place where you're spending the right time, the precious time that you have with the most strategic people to move us to, towards our joint goal of winning the White House and, um, and, and the Electoral College. So let's go back to that little um, visual for a second. There's four quadrants up here. Uh, on the upper left-hand corner, we've got high turnout and low support. On the upper right-hand quadrant, we've got high turnout, high support people. 
on the lower quadrant, lower uh, sort of, I guess it's my left. I'm not sure if it's your left too. Uh, we have low support and uh, low turnout. And sorry, there's a little typo. I should say low turnout in the bottom. Um, and then we have high support, low turnout. Um, when you're thinking about the different people in uh, Arizona, let's say, that we want to be talking to in order to try to win the electoral college votes that we need in Arizona to get us to that 270 electoral votes, um, who do you think is the most impactful group of people to be talking to. High turnout, high support. Is it high turnout, low support? Remember that's a little typo on the bottom and the very bottom it should say low turnout. Low turnout, high support. You can type, type in the chat box if you have ideas. I see some right answers, some medium right answers. All right, so the most important crew of people that we can be talking to, uh, there's there's two of them actually, are uh, low turnout, high support. And how do those people need to be moved? So they're unlikely to turn out to vote, but they really support our candidate. Those people need help figuring out when to vote, what day, how they're gonna get to vote. What uh, they're gonna, what they need to bring in terms of ID or um, uh, like you know proof of address, if anything, right? So those people we call turnout voters, and those are folks who traditionally are uh, more lower income communities, they're more communities of color, they're people who have systematic, um, on purpose white supremacist barriers to voting. Um, legislation in the past has made it harder for those people to vote. And so our key thing we need to persuade those people to do is to turn out and go to the polls. We don't need to persuade them usually to support our candidate. And the campaigns are all going to identify what that pool of people is. And then we're going to use the persuasion tactics that we're going to learn in a few minutes to help make sure that they actually get to the polls. So that's a big proportion of the work that we need to do. All right, what's the other population of folks who's really who are really important to turn out in an election? can type in the chat box here. Yep, I see some other, you'd think it was high turnout, high support, but those people are us. We're high turnout, high support. We support these candidates and we are um, ready to turn out and vote. We know exactly what, where our precinct polling location is. We know what we need to bring. We're regular voters. It's the high turnout, low support folks who uh, there's a portion of them that are going to be, you know, high turnout for Trump. We don't want to waste any time spending persuading them. Um, they're probably not going to flip, but there's a bunch of undecided folks, especially in places like Arizona. You guys know because you did this in Orange County. So those voters are called your persuasion voters. So we've got your turnout voters and your persuasion voters. Um, persuasion voters need to be persuaded to, they already vote, they need to be persuaded to vote for our person. And then turnout voters uh, already like our person, they need to be persuaded to vote. So let's talk about persuasion and what we actually can do based on brain science to get these people to take action. Next slide. So I just wanted to really drive home. You guys know this because you live in Orange County, but this is something so many amazing activists really waste a lot of time and energy doing. Um, in campaigns, we actually rate we give a number score to every single person that we talk to that's called the support score. And we rate that one through five. So one means someone is a strong supporter of our candidate. And when you do your walking, maybe you'll do minivan or you'll make phone calls, they'll ask you to mark people one through five. Strong supporter, one. Five, strong opponent. This person is like probably a volunteer for Trump. They are probably a volunteer for you know, the congressional opponent that we're fighting against. Uh, do we want to spend our mo most precious resource trying to argue with them? No, you don't go on to Drudge Report and comment. I mean, maybe you do, but I wouldn't recommend wasting your time doing it and comment there trying to you know, persuade people to have a different opinion. We want to spend our time and energy on people who are one through three. Um, one, strong supporter. Two, they are um, sort of leaning in our direction and three, they're undecided. Uh, so anytime you get tempted to get in an argument with your crazy uncle or your uh, ridiculous Antifa neighbor, don't spend time on them. They are going to suck out the life and energy from you like a Death Eater a la Harry Potter and we are just like not here for that. So um, that is, if you take nothing away from this presentation, don't waste your time on the fours and the fives. 
Uh, time is our most precious resource. Next slide. So where are we finding these people? In Arizona, in uh, Orange County, where do we find folks, especially given these really strange little germ balls that are floating around everywhere? Um, not as much on surfaces as we thought, but definitely on droplets, which is why we all wear masks anytime we go outside. Uh, how are we campaigning in this really strange COVID-19 world? Campaigns are really doing, if I may say so myself, a fantastic job of being nimble and flexible as they think about voter contact in the age of Corona. So there's three different things to think about and to consider as you decide where and when to put your turnout energy and your persuasion energy uh, using these brilliant tactics we're going to deploy in just a few minutes um, to get to 50% plus one or 270 electoral votes. Uh, depending on whether you're focusing on local elections or again, the electoral college. Uh, so three different uh, sort of tips and advice, uh, pieces of advice. Number one, campaigns are the best place to volunteer if you can volunteer directly campaign because they have the most updated targeting lists and they're spending the most money on analytics to really understand exactly who those one, twos and threes are in much more depth than outside groups. So if, if there's like a little target, the center of the target is campaigns themselves. If you can actually volunteer for the Biden campaign or for the Harley Ruta campaign or for whatever local campaign, Katie Porter, um, you should volunteer for those campaigns themselves. The second tier out are a, a slate of organizations called electoral advocacy organizations. So um, WAVE is connected with a whole bunch of them. Uh, definitely go through WAVE. They can help you get connected either to the campaign or to that second ring. But if you can't go through WAVE or you wanna do more than just WAVE, you wanna build a bigger community, Swing Left has great stuff, Indivisible does great stuff. And these are organizations that can't legally coordinate with those campaigns, but they have a really good sense of what the campaigns do. So. Um, that's the first tip. The second tip is, you know your communities better than most. Uh, and in general, in Arizona, even though there's sort of mask, uh, there's, there's less, there's more leniency around masks than there is here. Um, we're going to be calling Arizona. We're probably not going to be taking buses out to, to go there. So use phones, use social media, um, really let meet people where they're at and let this moment uh, be the moment that it is. It's not a moment where we're going to do a lot of face-to-face -face campaigning and that's hard, but that's not going to be prohibitive. Um, and then the third thing I'd say is uh, your digital assets, your Facebook, your Twitter, um, they're actually incredibly valuable in ways that they've never been before. So if you aren't digitally savvy or digitally native, now's uh, a better time than most to really uh, amp up your personal use of social media tools and listen to those groups to wave and to the other groups surrounding them about how to deploy your digital resources accordingly. So we're going to get creative. We're going to you know, follow what's most safe and do what's most comfortable, uh, but really use your, uh, your core resources um, in smart ways. Okay, so next slide. So how do I decide what and where to do? There's a ton of different things, even if we're just sitting behind screens um, and we're not necessarily uh, out door knocking, you know, that requires data entry in a different way it did. Uh, there's a lot of different things you could do in order to help the campaign. You could raise, you could do fundraising where you're helping the campaign hire more staff that do the work that we do. If you don't really like talking face to face to people, you could do, um, uh, uh, house parties where you're organizing or virtual Zoom house parties where you're organizing other people in Orange County who want to make phone calls into Arizona to join up and uh, talk about why they're motivated and commit to making calls together or all be on a Slack or a text message chain, you know, giving support every Thursday night so that you're all committing uh, jointly. We see in workout uh, regimens that being a part of a group really helps people commit. Um, you could just be alone and phone bank yourself every Tuesday and Thursday night through one of the great apps that the Wave crew is going to uh, check you into. A, a couple things to check as you're thinking about how you want to get involved. We're going to ask you to do some commitments in a second. Really be aligned with the what and the why. So if you haven't yet, take a second now to really inventory why you, from a sort of intellectual perspective, why you're doing this work and and what matters most to you? You know, does it matter most that you're connected to people in Orange County or does it matter most to you that you're making a real direct to voter impact in Arizona and, and calling folks there? In your heart, what's your motivation? What issues really move you? What uh, What really makes you angry? 
Um, how are you going to channel that and make sure you're not just like hanging out watching NBC, but you're actually, you know, sending it outwards. And then what skills and tools do you have? Are you connected to um, networks of people who have wealth that they could leverage in support of this campaign? Or are you someone that's more talkative and really likes, you know, getting uh, uh, in the weeds with people um, person to person? So you can really take an inventory of the different, um, your head, your heart and your hands to understand how you should get involved in this cycle and where you should get involved too. All right, next slide. Let's get into the exciting stuff. So here is the hardest part. Let's talk about the science of persuasion. So next slide. Remember, we have our turnout voters who we're trying to persuade to actually go out and vote. And then we have our persuasion voters who are trying to persuade to vote for our candidates. You don't understand the like exact analytical math of how many turnout voters and how many persuasion voters we should be contacting. The campaigns and WAVE and the inner circle folks have that math and they'll be sharing it with you in the lists that they give you to make sure you're talking to the most optimized people. So I want you to just like take a moment and think about outside of politics entirely. Put yourself in the moment of a time when you were convinced your opinion was changed in a non-political context. Maybe your kid finally convinced them to buy you a bike. Uh, yeah, so take a moment, put yourself there. All right, we're gonna go back to the slide for a second. And then I want you to think about a time when your opinion changed on a political topic. So maybe it was marriage equality. Maybe it was climate change. Maybe it was gun violence prevention. Um, maybe it was racial justice recently and you you realized that you had been doing things wrong as an accomplice and an ally all along why did it change who influenced you i'm just going to give folks a second to let these two instances sink in these two instances of persuasion in your own life so if you think about those instances what worked what moved you to change changing is one of the hardest things that you can type in the chat box some folks are saying it was your family and friends. Some folks are saying it was hearing it enough times over and over again. It was seeing it in an emotional sort of context that really moved you in a different way. Good. All of those things are exactly the same things that work in a political context. Um, all of and, and there's ways to sort of essentialize those into tips and tricks that help us persuade um voters to turn out and to vote and we'll we'll talk at some other instance about how we persuade elected officials because that's a really exciting toolkit as well so let's go to the next slide one of the things i saw people say in the chat box is that stories really moved you maybe you your opinion was changed uh about uh immigration when you saw the heartbreaking picture of the refugee child the two-year-old next to his father um, and that absolutely moved you to, to an extent that you um, completely flipped your, your perception on immigration. Pictures are a type of story as well. Um, so let's click through. There's a couple animations here. Click, uh, click, click, click. We're going to get to all the pictures here. Click. All right, perfect. So these are the three uh, archetypes that uh, don't necessarily use stories. So what happens in our brain, the science behind persuasion, is that um, we we're all really simple cave people at our base. Uh, and those of you who are on the, on the paleo diet or have been uh, know that, that you believe this to be true in another instance. Um, so as cave people, whenever we're, we are faced with some type of threat, we go into our amygdala right here at the back of our brain goes into what, what's called fight or flight. Um, and so all of a sudden the crocodile amygdala um, instead of really thinking and reacting rationally to something that's a perceived threat, we freeze up and um, all of this cortisol flows through our body. And all of a sudden we stop being this like self-possessed, um, wonderful, centered person that we might be in other contexts. And we, our, our monkey brain, our crocodile brain just takes over. And what happens, what we see, the three archetypes that we see when people are faced with someone that doesn't uh, have aligned values politically to them, we see these three different archetypes pop up. One is chatty Chad. Chatty Chad, just like the minute that someone disagrees with them, chatty Chad blah, 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 goes into this long tirade and talk, 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 talks until the person across from them completely zones out. Okay, so some of you on this call are chatty Chads. I'm a chatty Chad. 
I, when I'm faced with uh, something that I disagree with, I will go right into like, but this, but that, but this, I'm going to argue, right? Um, and I have all these stories. Um, what happens to the person across from you when that, when that happens? They freeze. They go into their own fight or flight, right? We don't want that to happen. All right. Then we've got next to Chatty Chad, we've got Policy Polly. Policy Polly uh, is a Wall Street Journal subscriber, a New York Times subscriber. Policy Polly reads white papers. Policy Polly, um, and I tried to flip up the gender normative sides of things because Policy Polly oftentimes can be a dude, but I don't want to be too um, gender normative or heteronormative. And chatty, chat, chatty Chad can sometimes be Chatty Kathy. Um, but Policy Polly just spews facts and figures at people. And what happens when facts and figures are spewed at you? Did anybody say facts and figures were what really moved me and changed my opinion when I was thinking about personal moments when I was persuaded? No. Facts and figures are helpful supporting evidence, but they're not the helpful core of the work. All right, and then let's go to the last. The last is Scripted Sally. So Scripted Sally is only comfortable reading from her script because it's really scary talking to other people, and I totally get it. Um, but we don't even go into fight or flight when we are faced with scripted Sally trying to persuade us to actually go vote or persuade us to vote for our candidate. We really uh, just get bored and our eyes glaze over and, and you've lost our attention. So on the phone, uh, doing digital persuasion, whether it's turnout persuasion or persuasion to uh, support our candidate, we can't be any of these three things. Let's click to the next slide. Talk about what we can be. Not you. You are not going to be that. Not after this training. Next slide. So um, you're going to be doing phone calls, you're gonna be doing digital advocacy, uh, and you're gonna be asked to do turnout work where you're persuading somebody to actually turn out and vote, or you're gonna be asked to do persuasion work. In turnout work, there's a really simple formula of things that actually persuade people scientifically, and we see this in all types of different studies that we've done um, uh, using A-B testing over the past decade or so. Uh, in turnout studies, connecting personally with someone using some of the different tactics we're going to train you on in a second uh, and then actually what's called making a plan to vote how are you going to get to your voting location who are you going to bring with you do you have kids do you have child care for election day are you going to have to work what time do polls open what do you need to bring with you asking folks to really work through the details of it um, in addition to the some of the tactics we're going to talk through are really what makes the magic happen and then in persuasion where you're trying to convince someone to vote for your candidate you're going to just use this framework that we're going to roll out in a second so next slide this is the simplest most effective framework out there for persuasion and it uh conveniently has a very helpful acronym irs two things that uh never um never go away death and taxes right so irs you're going to remember this forever because it's really an easy acronym to remember so inquire relate share is the framework that we're going to use in turnout conversations and persuasion conversations in order to really connect and move away from that crocodile brain, the monkey brain, the amygdala, the cortisol, the fight or flight uh, that you and other people get into when you're having conversations about politics, uh, whether it's to help them actually turn out and vote or it's to help them um, vote for your candidate. So what does that actually look like in real life? I'm gonna pretend that um, I'm gonna like two people at once to pretend that I'm a persuadable voter um, and uh, just show one simple example of how this might work in real life. And then we'll sort of close out and get to some reflection and some questions. Um, I am on a phone call and I'm calling a voter in Arizona and the phone rings, ring, ring, ring. And uh, this voter answers the phone and it is, um, it's Bob. And Bob, according to my call sheet, is a persuadable voter who hasn't yet decided who they're going to vote for, but is high turnout. And they're an independent voter. So there's a likelihood that they might vote for President Biden and the other candidates or, or Vice President Biden, soon to be President Biden and the other candidates that I'm talking for. So ring, 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 Bob answers the phone. Hi, this is Bob. <laughs> this is this is gonna be fun, guys. Hi, this is Sarah. I'm a volunteer with Vice President's campaign, Vice President Biden's campaign for president. Um, do you have a minute to talk today? Uh, yeah, I just have a minute. I'm about to make dinner. Okay, great. So I've got him on the phone. I've I asked a question sort of already in inquiry mode to reel him in and not just like blah, 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 go into the script or go into my persuasion. All right. 
So Bob, um, I am uh, calling, um, I'm with Vice President's campaign, as I mentioned, and I'm hoping to understand really what matters to you in this election cycle. Uh, and if you've decided on a candidate yet, again, I'm inquiring, right? Instead of going into the script about why to vote for Vice President Biden. Well, um, you know, I don't have a ton of time here, but uh, I really care about immigration. And um, I'm not sure if uh, Trump or Biden has a better stance for me. Okay, so that is we've inquired. And so we've gotten the voter to give us a tidbit about themselves and their own values and and issues that they care about which is gold the minute that you can flip it from you talking at them whether it's policy perspectives or it's um, chatty chatty your own stuff or it's the script you've reeled somebody in and you're ready to have a real conversation so we'll flip i won't i won't make you hear my bob voice uh <laughs> too much longer but um what you're going to do when they name what issue they care about you move to the R portion, if we could see the screen again, the R portion of our training. So um, Bob says he cares about um, immigration. I'm going to relate to that. Gee, Bob, I immigration is one of my top issues as well. You know, you might not know this, but my dad is an immigrant. He came here um, when he was 30 uh, and he uh, was a doctor who put himself through school abroad uh, and wanted to come practice in the States because he married a woman who was American and there was more opportunity here. And so I really care about immigration in the same way. I'd love to hear more about why you care about immigration. So I just inquired, I related and I flipped back to a little bit more inquiry to like really dig a little deeper. Remember, you want to get as much landscape on these people as you possibly can. And uh, you're sharing a little bit about yourself as well. Um, so you want to get into as much of a quick conversation. You don't want the conversation to be more than five minutes or so where you're flipping between inquiring, relating and sharing um, with this other person. And then the last tidbit in the conversation is you want to ID them again to see if your conversation moved them at all. So, Bob, it was really lovely talking to you about immigration reform. I know a little bit more about your story. You know a little bit about mine. President Biden, Vice President Biden has the values that both of us really care about. I can tell just from this one conversation. And I'm curious if our conversation has helped move you any further towards supporting the vice president than you were when we first started. Uh, that's when you get a sense. Remember that one, two, three, four, five. If they moved maybe from a three to a two and you're going to mark that down. The biggest thing to know also scientifically is that it takes the average person seven times of hearing something a bunch of you guys said this in your persuasion uh little i heard it i asked got asked for a bike so many times for my kid that i was finally persuaded or told that white privilege is uh, and white supremacy is ingrained in all of us and all of us are a little bit racist so many different times before it actually sunk in um your conversation alone is not going to be what moves people um solely you're just trying to move them a tick down on that one through five scale so that after a few conversations, they're actually moved. Same thing goes for turning out to vote. They've got to have that conversation a few times, which is why you have to, if you can, commit to doing calls over and over and over again as many times as you possibly can in the next months to come. Keep the, the fun trick here is that you can kind of do reflection on any issue. Um, and I would really encourage you ahead of phone banking to do that, to actually go back to the last slide for a second. You can think about any given issue. You can think about environment, you know, climate change uh, work. You can think about gun violence prevention. You can think about healthcare reform. You can think about actually turning out to vote uh, and using the IRS model and these basic questions. I would even just take a second to quietly write out things before you phone bank for the first time. You know, what is your personal one-liner on uh, why you care about climate change, why it's really personal for you? What is your personal one-liner on why you care about gun violence prevention or why you care about racial justice in this country or criminal justice reform? Um, what questions could you ask of the person on the other end of the phone or the other end of the computer to really get underneath the hood of their head, heart, and hands? Um, and how might you relate that without having to know all the policy facts or details back to vice president's platform, vice president Biden's platform, um, so that you can really be as impactful as possible. So um, let's click back to the last commitment portion here. We're gonna close this out with some commitments. Next slide. So what do you wanna commit to doing? You've got more skills than the average bear. You understand kind of the 
things we have to do to get to 50% plus one or 270 electoral votes. You understand you're not going to waste time with people who are fours or fives. You're going to really listen to the targeted analytical scientific lists that campaigns that people closely surrounding them have access to as they're really helping you get creative about how to organize in the time of coronavirus. Um, how do you want to take action? What will you do? Where will you do it? Are you going to raise money? Are you going to contact voters? Are you going to do persuasion work and turnout vote work? When are you going to make time to do this? Is this going to be something that you do once a week at the same time? Is it something that you're going to commit to doing twice a week, uh, but you have to schedule it in as each week progresses? How are you going to hold yourself accountable to taking these lessons that you've learned and all the lessons you'll learn through all the work and the continuous learning that you do as you have conversation after conversation that teaches you to make sure you really follow through on this passion that you have in this moment, but might not in the heat of, you know, summer. When, how will you feel if you keep your commitment? How will you feel if you break it the day after the election or the night of the election? How did you feel in 2016? I want you to just like breathe into those commitments. And if you can, in the worksheet that's provided, just jot down a few thoughts. So this marks the end of our training time together. A group of women who knew that they would be more disappointed by the things they didn't do than by the things they did, gathered in a living room to ask themselves how they could be the force of progress and positive change in their community. Together, they found common ground in the American values and ethics in which they each believed. So they formed WAVE, Women for American Values and Ethics, then got to doing. First as a small group, then larger and larger, and they are out there doing the work of change. Change takes the dedication to knock on doors, to organize, to register voters, and to speak for those with marginalized voices. Change takes women across generations coming together to rise with the expectancy of a better community. And as we know, these women helped to build a wave that would change the landscape forever.